the study of the morning, which is again dealing with first principles and fundamentals that we never should get far away from. And I'm calling this sermon simply Born of God. When I turn over, and we've just done this recently, though we haven't reached this chapter yet, but in 1 John chapter 5 and verse number 1, the apostle wrote, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Now, there are a number of scriptures throughout the New Testament that declare that belief saves. We don't have a problem with any of those. That's what the good book says. Belief is essential to one being saved by God from his or her sins. But for years and years now, beginning in the 1500s as a reaction to meritorious works of salvation, which is what the Roman Catholic Church offers, men in rebellion to that ran far to the other extreme, and they declared simply salvation by faith. But they added something. They added only. That, I categorically and wholeheartedly deny, is the truth of the teaching of the New Testament. One is not saved by faith only. And the Bible nowhere, especially the New Testament, teaches such a thing. And John didn't teach it here when he wrote these things so long ago. Now, if you look also a chapter earlier, in the book of John. 1 John 4 and verse number 7. Keeping in mind what he said in 1 John 5, 1 that we read to you. He said, everyone that loveth is born of God. Now if I were to take this passage that says that everyone that loveth is born of God. As people do all the passages that says that belief saves then I would say loving God alone saves you without any other thing involved in your salvation. But you see, reading 1 John 5, 1 or verses like that, or reading 1 John 4, 7 and verses like that, they do not tell the whole story. The New Testament gives you the composite or the whole whatever topic he treats, not just many times and most of the time in one verse or a few verses, but it takes a number of verses. In other words, you can't find that one must hear the gospel of Christ, that one must on the basis of the gospel be brought to faith in Christ as the Son of God, that one must, having believed in Christ, repent of one's sins, and having repented of sins, one must confess with the mouth that Christ is the Son of God. And following confession of faith, be baptized into Christ for the remission of one's sins. You cannot find that in one verse. It's not there. You can't even find all of that in two verses or three verses. You have to take, as we've said countless times, the totality of the Bible's teaching on how one's saved, when one's saved. Thus, as we look at both of these verses found in 1 John, and these people had become Christians, their brethren, when he wrote this letter to them. We look at 1 John 2 and verse 29. Notice this. Everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. Now all of that in the same epistle. Holy Spirit guided the apostles on to write it. And remember for those in the class on Wednesday night, we pointed out that John wrote that saying in the very first few verses that I'm writing this so that your fellowship will be with God even as the apostles' fellowship is with God and that your joy as Christians may be full. But he says all of this 
in these three different places in the same epistle, 1 John. Everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. So from these verses, I think it follows that the one who believes, the one who loves, and the one who does righteousness is what? That's the one that's born of God. We cannot leave out any verse that pertains to what it takes for anyone to be born of God. Now, again, if I would recommend anything, I'd say you ought to memorize, I think I said that in class this morning, Psalms 119, verse 172. My tongue shall speak thy word, David said. For all thy commandments are righteousness. Well, notice what he said in verse John 2, 29. Everyone that doeth righteousness is born of God. How do you do righteousness? Well, all God's commandments are righteousness. You obey the commandments of God. There's just no other way around it. It's that simple. So the one that loves or the one that believes, the one that loves and the one that obeys righteousness is the one that is born of God. Now look at 1 John chapter 4 and verse 7. Everyone that loves is born of God and knoweth God. Well, don't forget what we already said. Or maybe I should put it this way. Don't forget what John, by inspiration, has already written. And we understand then that to believe and to love and to obey the commandments of God to do righteousness is the one that knows God how can a person say I know God and yet fail in doing all God requires of that person to become a Christian or as living the Christian life and being faithful doing those things God requires for one to be faithful Now, what is the love of God? Oh, there's so much said about that. I couldn't say. It would be impossible all my life of preaching the gospel. We hear about the love of God. We've spent a lot of time on that in 1 John. Well, it's like anything else the Bible teaches. There's a lot of false doctrine out there about God's love for us and what it means and our love for God, and what that means. But again, and I've often done this over the years with 1 John chapter 5 and verse 3. Notice we're still in the first epistle of John. I've often been preaching like this in a gospel meeting and said, do you want to see the love of God in your life or anybody else's? And most people, I don't ask for show hands, but in their minds, they, they will say, if they're paying attention and interested, they'll say yes. Well, John says, for this is the love of God. And I usually say, what is the love of God? And John says that we keep his commandments. You can't get clearer than that. God didn't say how much you smile at one another. Or how well you warmly shake somebody's hand. Or whether you hug them or they, you don't. He said plainly that if you keep his commandments. This is the love of God that we keep his commandments. And I'll interrupt myself here and say, and I hope I don't embarrass him. Robert, it's good to see you, sir. We appreciate it. So, who knows God? He that saith, I know God, or I know Him, and keepeth not His commandments, John pulls no punches here, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Now, don't forget all we've already said. 
The Bible says, 1 John 5, 1, it says it elsewhere in the scriptures, that whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Our subject is, the bo- is born of God. But it also says, same epistle, same writer, inspired of the same spirit, 1 John 4, 7, everyone that loveth is born of God. And then in the same epistle, 1 John 2 and verse 29, everyone that doeth righteousness is born of God or born of Him. And so we see, we take all of it. We don't take any one verse and say we're saved by faith only or we're saved by love only or we're saved by righteousness only even. You know, all of us, I think, here this morning have a Bible. We all would say that's the Word of God. And we would all reference probably... 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished in every good work. We know that. You can admit that. You can confess it all day long. But what if you don't study it? You know that verse. You say, it's the Word of God and just carry it around under your arm all the time or lay it on the coffee table. It's not going to do you any good. You know that it's here to be studied. And thus Paul says, study to show thyself approved unto God. A word with it, he did not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2.15. So again I say, from the scriptures we've noticed that it must follow that one who believes and one who loves and one who does righteousness is born of God. Now, since all of God's commandments are righteousness, then shouldn't I realize this is saying I must learn the commandments of God? They're given from God to us as commandments. What's a commandment? They're to be obeyed. They're to be obeyed. So one who does the commandments of God is born of God. What if one does not do the commandments of God pertaining to being born of God? He's not going to be born of God. So everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. And I said earlier, the love of God, can can the love of God be seen in your life and my life? Yes, for this is the love of God that we, that's Christians, keep His commandments. A person's not a Christian. He says, I want to become a Christian, uh, just like Paul became a Christian. Okay, let's study what God's commandment said, well, I don't want to do what he says. But I want to be born of God. Well, I would say you'll never be born of God. If you don't believe in him and you love him and you work righteousness, knowing all the commandments of God are righteousness, it pertains to being born of God. So he that saith, I know him and keepeth not his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. Let's look at a few ideas along this line. In John 1, 11 through 13, the Gospel of John, that is, the Scripture reads, He came unto His own, His own received Him not. But to as many as received Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of God. Now watch it. Even to them that believe on His name. Now, does this say the moment you believe in Christ as the Son of God, your Savior, that He saves you. Do you realize it doesn't say that? It says simply that if you have believed, you have been given the power to become. Listen to it again. But as many as received Him, now they've received Him. I hear preachers all over the place say, just receive Jesus as your personal Savior. But is that enough? Well, these folks received Him. And to those that received him, notice, to them. Who's to them? Those that received him. To them he gave power to become the sons of God. Well, according to current denominational doctrine, I say current. It is current, but it's been going on for about 500 years. That the moment you believe without any other acts of obedience, you're saved. That doesn't say that in the scripture. Does it mean that belief is essential, a must, obligatory? Indeed it does. But it also says that the believer then is given the power 
to become a child of God. Notice, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Of the will of God. Again, John 1, 11 through 13. Now again, except a man be born, and this is Jesus talking to Nicodemus, except a man be born again, and then he goes ahead to say, be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God, John 3, 3 and 5. That gets pretty interesting to me. I, I want to be saved. I want to be born again. I want to be in the kingdom of God. Well, Jesus is speaking. He should know how to tell me. He's the Savior. He should know how to make me a citizen of his own kingdom, of which he is the king. And, of course, that's in John 3, 3 and 5 through 5. So entrance into the kingdom of God is contingent upon a new birth. And it's not a birth that's physical. Now this being true, it's necessary that we understand what that birth is and how it is brought about. Notice another very familiar passage. Jesus says in Matthew 6, verse 33, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. But he also says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Matthew 7, and verse 21. Well, are these scriptures arrayed against one another? Are they standing in opposition to one another? No. What we've noticed is being born again connects directly to being a citizen of the kingdom of heaven and how one becomes a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. Well, to become a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, you must be born again. Now, let me pause here and say this too. I hear all over the place among the denominational people who are not speaking as oracles of God, a born-again Christian. A born-again Christian. A person is born again in order to become a Christian, a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, a child of God, a member of the church, the body of Christ. But yet there are doctrines out there that says you're saved the moment you believe without any other acts of obedience. And thus, you're not born of water in the Spirit. You're saved before you ever are born of water in the Spirit. So you must be born again. And by this birth, you do enter the kingdom. You become a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. And yet we're taught here in Matthew 6, 33, that I should seek first the kingdom. And then I must do the will of God to enter the kingdom. Well, let's look at some of this material. It stands thusly. First of all, I must be born again. I must be born into the kingdom of God. Or, number two, do the will of God to enter the kingdom. To say one's to say the other. So, does it not indicate there's something obligatory upon me that must be done in order to enter the kingdom of God? Well, I must do the will of God to enter the kingdom. And when I do the will of God according to the totality of the scriptures, bearing on the matter, I am born again. So it follows then that to seek a diligent search of patient inquiry, to seek the kingdom of God, is the same as to seek to know the will of God for me. And when I do the will of God, I'm born again or I enter the kingdom by new birth. 
And I had to be born again in order to enter the kingdom. Surely that's clear in John 3 in verse 5. If you're not born again, you don't enter the kingdom. So therefore, when I do the will of God, I can only conclude that then and then only am I born again. Well, one must be born again to be saved from past sins. And those born again are saved. And you know the reason I know that? I can't conceive of somebody born in the kingdom of God and still in their alien sins, the sins that originally separated them from God. Something has to be done about those sins of which we are, we are guilty. So I do the will of God. I'm born again. I must be born again to be saved from my sins. Those born again then are saved. But now notice the saved, those saved from their sins, are in Christ. And it follows that whatever is necessary to bring into Christ is necessary for the new birth because I can't see anybody in Christ that's not a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. And I can't see anybody that's a citizen of the kingdom of heaven unless they've been born again. And you can't be born again unless you're born of water and the Spirit. And it's the Spirit that reveals the mind of Christ and the will of Christ that teaches, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. So Christ is certainly necessary to the new birth. Oh, the one that enters Christ, the one that enters Christ does so by what is called by the scriptures being born again or birth. Now, why is that the case? Because first of all, the one born again is saved. And next of all, number two, salvation is in Christ. And third, we may draw the conclusion, therefore, that the birth brings into Christ. And fourth, one is baptized into Christ. And it's explicitly said there by Paul in Galatians 3 and verse 27. There's no other doorway into Christ except to be baptized into Christ. But to be baptized into Christ is to be born of water in the Spirit. And to be born of water in the Spirit is to enter the kingdom of which Christ is head. So nobody's in the kingdom that has not been baptized into Christ. One is therefore in the church who is baptized into Christ. And in the day the church started in Acts chapter 2, the people who were baptized for the remission of sins were added to the church by the Lord Himself, Acts 2 and verse 47. So then in being baptized, one's doing the will of God. And thus, baptism to the penitent believer is simply being born again. Who's qualified to be baptized? One must be a believer. And faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. Romans 10, 17. Now you're in a position to receive further instructions. And thus we have Acts 17, 30 or Luke 13, 3 and 5 that says one must repent of sin. That's something you do and I do. It's a resolve of the heart to cease living contrary to the will of God. Death means separation. You die to the old man of sin. Now, you confess your faith in Christ, Romans 10, 10. Now you're ready to be buried. You see, you're dead to a life of sin. You bury a dead man. And thus, Romans 6, 3 and 4 and Colossians 2, 12 says that we're buried with Christ in baptism. And in Colossians 2, 12, through faith in the operation of God. This is God operating on you. He doesn't operate on you to make you a Christian except that you receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul, James said. Well, it's able to save your soul because it tells you what to do. We're back to the commandments. You want to see the love of God? Then see it in people keeping the commandments of God. Does that give, us more, give more impetus over what is said in Ecclesiastes? Let's hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. In the Hebrew, it's just the whole of man. So, since we're baptized into Christ, it follows that baptism is necessary to the new birth. Necessary to be born of God. It's a beginning point, but it's highly significant. 
Most of those who claim Christ as Savior don't believe what I've just said. The great majority, if you go by the majority and you say, well, we're going to go, all those who say Christ is the Son of God and the Savior of the world, uh, we're going to be democratic. We're just going to allow all the denominations to vote and everybody that believes what I just said is to vote and we're going to go what the majority says. Well, you're going to lose your soul if you do that. Because we don't go by what the majority believes. The Lord's church is a kingdom. Christ's word is absolute. It's the final say-so. And we don't vote on such things. That may be hard for good Americans to understand. But we are to do what the Lord said, regardless of what anybody else believes or doesn't believe, or they do or they don't do. We're to do what is right as the Bible defines the right. Remember that the Apostle Peter said at the household of Cornelius, the first uncirc uncircumcised Gentile convert, what he saw, because he still was thinking that everything that pertained to salvation through Christ pertained to the Jews, and he says, I learned something here. And he says, of a truth, it's the truth, of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. I watch it. But in every nation he that feareth him. Now watch it. And worketh righteousness is accepted with him. Well, we should know by now what worketh righteousness means in view of the fact all of God's commandments are righteousness. And we've seen already what is made clear in 1 John 2, 29. Everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. So it's rather obvious then that whoever you are, red, yellow, black, or white, old, young, male, or female, rich or poor, if you're old enough to be accountable to God for your actions and you know you've sinned against your God and sin is the transgression of God's law, 1 John chapter 3, verse 4, that you stand separated from God. That's what it means to be in a lost condition. And you need salvation. Well, God's done His part. In fact, in his party did everything for us we never, never, never could do for ourselves. But thus he gave us his word. And that tells us since we are intellectual, accountable people with free will, here's what you need to make up your mind that you're going to do or not to do. Sadly, the Bible teaches most people who ever live on this earth won't do what God said. But there's that few who the gospel appeals to. The few who are willing to sacrifice everything there is to be obedient to God. The apostles would say to Christ, we've left everything and followed you. Christ reminded them, well, the foxes have their holes and the birds of there have their nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. I've been there before you. I've built no attachments to this physical world that would make me want to stay here. Christians must do that or don't call yourself a pilgrim describing your Christian life. Pilgrims don't put down roots. They travel through to their final destination. So if we, if ye know that he is righteous, John writes, if you know he's righteous, and we do, don't we? We know Christ is righteous. And no sin involved with him. He says, if you know he's righteous, now watch Something else you also know. Ye know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. How do you know a person is born of God? He obeys the commandments of God. And thus, Saul of Tarsus, a persecutor of the church, having been brought to belief in Christ as the Son of God, was told by Christ to go into Damascus, the street called Straight, and he had to wait then. Now Christ appeared to Ananias, a Christian and a gospel preacher, and said, you go. Well, the persecuting Saul's reputation had already reached there, and Ananias says, well, he's a terrible fellow. He's, we know about him. He's doing nothing but persecuting the church. Christ says, well, I've told him how many things he must suffer for the cause of Christ. Now think about that. 
Christ told Paul, because he was an apostle of Christ, he saw him as the resurrected Lord to be an apostle, and he actually says, now I'm going to tell you before you get started, here are all these things you're going to have to suffer for me. And so he sends Ananias, and he comes there, and who's he find? He finds a believer. Well, the denominational world say, that's fine, he's, he's ready. It's obvious from his fasting, his praying, man's been blind ever since he was on the road, had to be led by the hand in Damascus. I, I've often wondered what internal grieving Saul of Tarsus was doing to come to full grips with the fact that everything I've been doing that I thought was doing God's will was against Christ. Remember Christ said, when he said, Who art thou, Lord? He said, I'm Jesus of Nazareth, whom thou persecutest. It's hard for you to get, get kick against the pricks. Meaning it's hard to go against the facts, the truth of the matter. What must I do, Lord? You go into the city of Damascus, and there shall be told thee what thou must do. As a believer who is repentant, and according to most people today, he's all right. Well, Jesus didn't know it because he told him to go find out what to do. And Nice didn't know it because he was sent to tell him what to do. And certainly Saul of Tarsus didn't know it because he's in misery in prayer waiting to be told what to do. And when he sees a believer who has the power now to become the Son of God, who obviously has repented, he's turned right against the thing he was coming there to do. The preacher says, what are you waiting on as a believer who's repented of sins? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins. When was his sins washed away? At belief? At repentance? Or when he was baptized into Christ for the remission of sins? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins. Calling on the name of the Lord, by the way, if you grammatically look at it, he called on the name or appealed to the authority of Christ to save him when he did what Christ told him in the way Christ told him and for the reason Christ told him. That's what's meant. And so Christ told him through the apostle or rather to the preacher, through the preacher, what to do to be saved. So Peter says that God accepts the man that doeth righteousness. John says the man that doeth righteousness is born of God. What may we conclude? It follows one must be born of him before God will accept him. And God accepts only those who are in Christ. Colossians 1 and verse 14 and Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7. All of these fundamental principles in their immediate context and their remote context harmonize. And you have to have a bunch of denominational false doctrine to lead you away from just what the book says. Few people will just study the book as it's God's will for man concerning his salvation. Most of them study it with various colored spectacles on. And if I look at this basically white wall through green glasses, it's going to be tinted green. If they're red, it's going to be tinted red. If it's yellow, it's going to be tinted yellow. And that's what human doctrines do to the Word of God. If I have my mind already taught and led into error, then I go and read the Bible. If I'm not careful, I just everywhere, such as I read that one saved it faith. I just think faith only. I never look beyond that. And yet we have seen in this brief lesson that belief is essential, that love is essential, but obedience to righteousness is essential. But righteousness are the commands of God. And we've seen that to be born again is to do the will of God pertaining to going through the new birth, which is a spiritual birth. And thus, that birth is being baptized into Christ. And you're raised to walk in newness of life. You're a new creature when you rise from the water and grave of baptism. Now, you're dedicated solely to God. That's all that matters to the true Christian in the Lord's church, the spiritual body of Christ. Everything's going to be governed by the will of Christ. Whatsoever you do, in word or in deed, 
do all in the name of the, of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father by Him. Now, have you been born again this morning? Have you obeyed the gospel? If you haven't, surely if you follow me, and especially those who have not done so and have listened intently and correctly and honestly throughout the weeks that we've touched on these things, however you've been exposed to New Testament teaching, you know what to do to become a Christian. You know you ought to become a Christian. All I can say is, why are you not yet doing it? I don't think it's hard to understand. Don't think the Bible's hard to be rightly divided if we really want it. There's got to be a hungering and a thirsting after righteousness. There's our word again. After the commandments of God. If you don't have that supreme love of God in Christ and the word of God to love the truth. Now remember John said that. That we're to love the truth. Then we can't be set free by it. As a child of God, we must cultivate that love of the truth and obedience to His will. And if we've deviated from that, the second law of pardon says repent of those sins and confess one's sins as a child of God and God will hear and forgive. We're on the road to heaven. Some of us are different places on that road as far as maturity and growth. The main thing is whether you're 20 or whether you're 80, whether you've been in the church five minutes, five years, 50 years, or whatever. It's where you are on that road in your faithfulness that makes the difference when you die. As to being covered by the blood of God through His Son, Jesus Christ. Are you subject to the Lord's invitation to become a Christian? If so, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.